from which all that exists derives its being. True salvation is a state of freedom from fear, from suffering, from a perceived state of lack and insufficiency, and therefore from all wanting, needing, grasping, and clinging. It is freedom from compulsive thinking, from negativity, and above all from past and future as a psychological need. Your mind is telling you that you cannot get there from here. Something needs to happen, or you need to become this or that before you can be free and fulfilled. It is saying, in fact, that you need time that you need to find, sort out, do, achieve, acquire, become, or understand something before you can be free or complete. You see time as the means to salvation, whereas in truth it is the greatest obstacle to salvation. You think that you can't get there from where and who you are at this moment, because you are not yet complete or good enough. But the truth is that here and now is the only point from where you can get there. You get there by realizing that you are there already. You find God the moment you realize that you don't need to seek God. So there is no only way to salvation. Any condition can be used, but no particular condition is needed. However, there is only one point of access. The now. There can be no salvation away from this moment. You are lonely and without a partner. Enter the now from there. You are in a relationship. Enter the now from there. There is nothing you can ever do or attain that will get you closer to salvation than it is at this moment. This may be hard to grasp for a mind accustomed to thinking that everything worthwhile is in the future. Nor can anything that you ever did or that was done to you in the past prevent you from saying yes to what is and taking your attention deeply into the now. You cannot do this in the future. You do it now or not at all. Love-hate relationships Unless and until you access the consciousness frequency of presence, all relationships, and particularly intimate relationships, are deeply flawed and ultimately dysfunctional. They may seem perfect for a while, such as when you are in love, but invariably that apparent perfection gets disrupted as arguments, conflicts, dissatisfaction, and emotional or even physical violence occur with increasing frequency. It seems that most love relationships become love-hate relationships before long. Love can then turn into savage attack, feelings of hostility, or complete withdrawal of affection at the flick of a switch. This is considered normal. The relationship then oscillates for a while, a few months or a few years, between the polarities of love and hate, and it gives you as much pleasure as it gives you pain. It is not uncommon for couples to become addicted to those cycles. Their drama makes them feel alive. When a balance between the positive-negative polarities is lost and the negative, destructive cycles occur with increasing frequency and intensity, which tends to happen sooner or later, then it will not be long before the relationship finally collapses. It may appear that if you could only eliminate the negative or destructive cycles, then all would be well, and the relationship would flower beautifully, but alas, this is not possible. The polarities are mutually interdependent. You cannot have one without the other. The positive already contains within itself the as yet unmanifested negative. Both are in fact different aspects of the same dysfunction. I am speaking here of what is commonly called romantic relationships not of true love which has no opposite because it arises from beyond the mind. Love as a continuous state is as yet very rare as rare as conscious human beings. Brief and elusive glimpses of love, however, are possible whenever there is a gap in the stream of mind. The negative side of a relationship is, of course, more easily recognizable as dysfunctional than the positive one. And it is also easier to recognize the source of negativity in your partner than to see it in yourself. It can manifest in many forms, possessiveness, jealousy, control, withdrawal and unspoken resentment, the need to be right, insensitivity and self-absorption, emotional demands and manipulation, the urge to argue, criticize, judge, blame or attack, anger, unconscious revenge for past pain inflicted by a parent, rage and physical violence. On the positive side, you are in love with your partner. This is at first a deeply satisfying state. You feel intensely alive. Your existence has suddenly become meaningful because someone needs you, wants you, and makes you feel special. And you do the same for him or her. When you are together, you feel whole, 
The feeling can become so intense that the rest of the world fades into insignificance. However, you may also have noticed that there is a neediness and a clinging quality to that intensity. You become addicted to the other person. He or she acts on you like a drug. You are on a high when the drug is available. But even the possibility or the thought that he or she might no longer be there for you can lead to jealousy, possessiveness, attempts at manipulation through emotional blackmail, blaming and accusing fear of loss. If the other person does leave you, this can give rise to the most intense hostility or the most profound grief and despair. In an instant, loving tenderness can turn into a savage attack or dreadful grief. Where is the love now? Can love change into its opposite in an instant? Was it love in the first place? Or just an addictive grasping and clinging? Addiction and the search for wholeness. Why should we become addicted to another person? The reason why the romantic love relationship is such an intense and universally sought after experience is that it seems to offer liberation from a deep-seated state of fear, need, lack, and incompleteness that is part of the human condition in its unredeemed and unenlightened state. There is a physical as well as a psychological dimension to this state. On the physical level, you are obviously not whole, nor will you ever be. You are either a man or a woman, which is to say, one half of the whole. On this level, the longing for wholeness the return to oneness manifests as male-female attraction, man's need for a woman, woman's need for a man. It is an almost irresistible urge for union with the opposite energy polarity. The root of this physical urge is a spiritual one. The longing for an end to duality, a return to the state of wholeness. Sexual union is the closest you can get to this state on the physical level. This is why it is the most deeply satisfying experience the physical realm can offer. But sexual union is no more than a fleeting glimpse of wholeness, an instant of bliss. As long as it is unconsciously sought as a means of salvation, you are seeking the end of duality on the level of form, where it cannot be found. You are given a tantalizing glimpse of heaven, but you are not allowed to dwell there and find yourself again in a separate body. On the psychological level, the sense of lack and incompleteness is, if anything, even greater than on the physical level. As long as you are identified with the mind, you have an externally derived sense of self. That is to say, you get your sense of who you are from things that ultimately have nothing to do with who you are. Your social role, possessions, external appearance, successes and failures, belief systems, and so on. This false, mind-made self, the ego, feels vulnerable, insecure, and is always seeking new things to identify with to give it a feeling that it exists. But nothing is ever enough to give it lasting fulfillment. Its fear remains. Its sense of lack and neediness remains. But then that special relationship comes along. It seems to be the answer to all the ego's problems and to meet all its needs. At least this is how it appears at first. All the other things that you derived your sense of self from before now become relatively insignificant. You now have a single focal point that replaces them all, gives meaning to your life and through which you define your identity. The person you are in love with, you are no longer a disconnected fragment in an uncaring universe, or so it seems. Your world now has a center. The loved one, the fact that the center is outside you and that, therefore, you still have an externally derived sense of self, does not seem to matter at first. What matters is that the underlying feelings of incompleteness, a fear, lack and unfulfillment so characteristic of the egoic state, are no longer there or are they? Have they dissolved or do they continue to exist underneath the happy surface reality? If in your relationships you experience both love and the opposite of love attack, emotional violence, and so on then it is likely that you are confusing ego attachment and addictive clinging with love. You cannot love your partner one moment and attack him or her the next. True love has no opposite. If your love has an opposite, then it is not love but a strong ego need for a more complete and deeper sense of self. A need that the other person temporarily meets. It is the ego's substitute for salvation. And for a short time, it almost does feel like salvation. But there comes a point when your partner behaves in ways that fail to meet your needs, or rather those of your ego. The feelings of fear, pain, and lack that are an intrinsic part of egoic consciousness, but had been covered up by the love relationship, now resurface. Just as with every other addiction, 
you are on a high when the drug is available, but invariably, there comes a time when the drug no longer works for you. When those painful feelings reappear, you feel them even more strongly than before. And what is more, you now perceive your partner as the cause of those feelings. This means that you project them outward and attack the other with all the savage violence that is part of your pain. This attack may awaken the partner's own pain, and he or she may counter your attack. At this point, the ego is still unconsciously hoping that its attack or its attempts at manipulation will be sufficient punishment to induce your partner to change their behavior so that it can use them again as a cover-up for your pain. Every addiction arises from an unconscious refusal to face and move through your own pain. Every addiction starts with pain and ends with pain. Whatever the substance you are addicted to, alcohol, food, legal or illegal drugs, or a person you are using something or somebody to cover up your pain. If they only knew how easy it is to access in the now the power of presence that dissolves the past and its pain, the reality that dissolves the illusion. If they only knew how close they are to their own reality, how close to God. Avoidance of relationships in an attempt to avoid pain is not the answer either. The pain is there anyway. Three failed relationships in as many years are more likely to force you into awakening than three years on a desert island or shut away in your room. But if you could bring intense presence into your aloneness, that would work for you too. From addictive to enlightened relationships, yes, being present and intensifying your presence by taking your attention ever more deeply into the now. Whether you are living alone or with a partner, this remains the key. For love to flourish, the light of your presence needs to be strong enough so that you no longer get taken over by the thinker or the pain body and mistake them for who you are. To know yourself as the being underneath the thinker, the stillness underneath the mental noise, the love and joy underneath the pain is freedom, salvation, enlightenment. To disidentify from the pain body is to bring presence into the pain and thus transmute it. To disidentify from thinking is to be the silent watcher of your thoughts and behavior especially the repetitive patterns of your mind and the roles played by the ego. If you stop investing it with selfness, the mind loses its compulsive quality, which basically is the compulsion to judge and so to resist what is, which creates conflict, drama, and new pain. In fact, the moment that judgment stops through acceptance of what is, you are free of the mind. You have made room for love, for joy, for peace. First you stop judging yourself, then you stop judging your partner. The greatest catalyst for change in a relationship is complete acceptance of your partner as he or she is, without needing to judge or change them in any way. That immediately takes you beyond ego. All mind games and all addictive clinging are then over. Love is a state of being. Your love is not outside, it is deep within you. You can never lose it, and it cannot leave you. It is not dependent on some other body, some external form. In the stillness of your presence, you can feel your own formless and timeless reality, as the unmanifested life that animates your physical form. What is God? The eternal one life underneath all the forms of life. What is love? To feel the presence of that one life deep within yourself and within all creatures. To be it, therefore, all love is the love of God. Love is not selective, just as the light of the sun is not selective. It does not make one person special. It is not exclusive. Exclusivity is not the love of God, but the love of ego. However, the intensity with which true love is felt can vary. There may be one person who reflects your love back to you more dearly and more intensely than others, and if that person feels the same toward you. It can be said that you are in a love relationship with him or her. The bond that connects you with that person is the same bond that connects you with the person sitting next to you on a bus, or with a bird, a tree, a flower. Only the degree of intensity with which it is felt differs. Even in an otherwise addictive relationship, there may be moments when something more real shines through. Something beyond your mutual addictive needs. These are moments when both your and your partner's mind briefly subside and the pain body is temporarily in a dormant state. This may sometimes happen during physical intimacy, or when you are both witnessing the miracle of childbirth, or in the presence of death, or when one of you is seriously ill anything, that renders the mind powerless. When this happens, your being, which is usually buried underneath the mind, 
becomes revealed, and it is this that makes true communication possible. You are a human mind again, pretending to be a human being, interacting with another mind, playing a drama called love. Although brief glimpses are possible, love cannot flourish unless you are permanently free of mind identification, and your presence is intense enough to have dissolved the pain body or you can at least remain present as the watcher. The pain body cannot then take you over and so become destructive of love. Relationships as spiritual practice. As the egoic mode of consciousness and all the social, political, and economic structures that it created enter the final stage of collapse, the relationships between men and women reflect the deep state of crisis in which humanity now finds itself. As humans have become increasingly identified with their mind, most relationships are not rooted in being, and so turn into a source of pain, and become dominated by problems and conflict. Millions are now living alone or as single parents, unable to establish an intimate relationship, or unwilling to repeat the insane drama of past relationships. Others go from one relationship to another, from one pleasure and pain cycle to another, in search of the elusive goal of fulfillment through union with the opposite energy polarity. Still others compromise and continue to be together in a dysfunctional relationship in which negativity prevails, for the sake of the children or security, through force of habit, fear of being alone, or some other mutually beneficial arrangement, or even through the unconscious addiction to the excitement of emotional drama and pain. However, every crisis represents not only danger, but also opportunity. If relationships energize and magnify egoic mind patterns and activate the pain body, as they do at this time, why not accept this fact, rather than try to escape from it? Why not cooperate with it instead of avoiding relationships or continuing to pursue the phantom of an ideal partner, as an answer to your problems? or a means of feeling fulfilled. The opportunity that is concealed within every crisis does not manifest until all the facts of any given situation are acknowledged and fully accepted. With the acknowledgement and acceptance of the facts also comes a degree of freedom from them. For example, when you know there is disharmony and you hold that knowing, through your knowing a new factor has come in, and the disharmony cannot remain unchanged. When you know you are not at peace, your knowing creates a still space that surrounds your non-peace in a loving and tender embrace, and then transmutes your non-peace into peace. As far as inner transformation is concerned, there is nothing you can do about it. You cannot transform yourself, and you certainly cannot transform your partner or anybody else. All you can do is create a space for transformation to happen, for grace and love to enter. So whenever your relationship is not working, Whenever it brings out the madness in you and in your partner, be glad. What was unconscious is being brought up to the light. It is an opportunity for salvation. Every moment. Hold the knowing of that moment, particularly of your inner state. If there is anger, know that there is anger. If there is jealousy, defensiveness, the urge to argue, the need to be right, an inner child demanding love and attention, or emotional pain of any kind whatever it is, Know the reality of that moment, and hold the knowing. The relationship then becomes your sadhana, your spiritual practice. If you observe unconscious behavior in your partner, hold it in the loving embrace of your knowing, so that you won't react. Unconsciousness and knowing cannot coexist for long even, if the knowing is only in the other person, and not in the one who is acting out the unconsciousness. The energy form that lies behind hostility and attack, finds the presence of love absolutely intolerable. If you react at all to your partner's unconsciousness, you become unconscious yourself. But if you then remember to know your reaction, nothing is lost. Humanity is under great pressure to evolve because it is our only chance of survival as a race. This will affect every aspect of your life and close relationships in particular. Never before have relationship been as problematic and conflict-ridden as they are now. As you ma have noticed, they are not here to make you happy or fulfilled. If you continue to pursue the goal of salvation through a relationship, you will be disillusioned again and again. But if you accept that the relationship is here to make you conscious instead of happy, and the relationship will offer you salvation, 
and you will be aligning yourself with the higher consciousness that wants to be born into this world. For those who hold on to the old patterns, there will be increasing pain, violence, confusion, and madness. I suppose that it takes two to make a relationship into a spiritual practice, as you suggest. For example, my partner is still acting out his of patterns of jealousy and control. I have pointed this out many times, but he is unable to see it. How many people does it take to make your life into a spiritual practice? Never mind if your partner will not cooperate. Sanity consciousness can only come into this world through you. You do not need to wait for the world to become sane or for somebody else to become conscious, before you can be enlightened. You may wait forever. Do not accuse each other of being unconscious. The moment you start to argue, you have identified with a mental position, and are now defending not only that position, but also your sense of self. The ego is in charge. You have become unconscious. At times, it may be appropriate to point out certain aspects of your partner's behavior. If you are very alert, very present, you can do so without ego involvement, without blaming, accusing, or making the other wrong. When your partner behaves unconsciously, relinquish all judgment. Judgment is either to confuse someone's unconscious behavior with who they are, or to project your own unconsciousness onto another person, and mistake that for who they are. To relinquish judgment does not mean that you do not recognize dysfunction and unconsciousness when you see it. It means being the knowing rather than being the reaction and the judge. You will then either be totally free of reaction, or you may react and still be the knowing. The space in which the reaction is watched and allowed to be. Instead of fighting the darkness, you bring in the light. Instead of reacting to delusion, you see the delusion yet at the same time look through it. Being the knowing creates a clear space of loving presence that allows all things and all people to be as they are. No greater catalyst for transformation exists. If you practice this, your partner cannot stay with you and remain unconscious. If you both agree that the relationship will be your spiritual practice, so much the better. You can then express your thoughts and feelings to each other as soon as they occur, or as soon as a reaction comes up, so that you do not create a time gap in which an unexpressed or unacknowledged emotion or grievance can fester and grow. Learn to give expression to what you feel without blaming. Instead of mirroring to each other your pain and your unconsciousness, instead of satisfying your mutual addictive ego needs, you will reflect back to each other the love that you feel deep within. The love that comes with the realization of your oneness with all that is. This is the love that has no opposite. If your partner is still identified with the mind and the pain body while you are already free, this will represent a major challenge not to you but to your partner. It is not easy to live with an enlightened person, or rather it is so easy that the ego finds it extremely threatening. Remember that the ego needs problems, conflict, and enemies to strengthen the sense of separateness on which its identity depends. The unenlightened partner's mind will be deeply frustrated because its fixed positions are not resisted, which means they will become shaky and weak, and there is even the danger that they may collapse altogether. Resulting in loss of self the pain body is demanding feedback and not getting it. The need for argument, drama, and conflict is not being met. But beware, some people who are unresponsive, withdrawn, insensitive, or cut off from their feelings, may think and try to convince others that they are enlightened, or at least, that there is nothing wrong with them and everything wrong with their partner. Men tend to do that more than women. They may see their female partners as irrational or emotional. But if you can feel your emotions, you are not far from the radiant inner body just underneath. If you are mainly in your head, the distant consciousness into the emotional. If there isn't an emanation of low toward all beings, then it is not person behaves in difficult or cha. If your enlightenment is egoic challenge that will bring out you anger, defensiveness, judgment, relationship, many of your chow example, a woman may be chow lives almost entirely in his head, her, to give her attention and spa. The absence of love in the relation a woman than a man, will trigger T attack her partner blame. Critic becomes his challenge. To defend he sees as totally unwarranted. He his mental positions as he do eventually. This may activate has been taken over. A level of deep you violence. 
Savage attack and cowan bodies have replenished themselves next time. This is only one of an endless and have been written, and many more unconsciousness is brought out. When you know that the menstrual flow is approaching, before you feel the first signs of what is commonly called premenstrual tension, the awakening of the collective female pain body, become very alert and inhabit your body as fully as possible. When the first sign appears, you need to be alert enough to catch it before it takes you over. For example, the first sign may be a sudden strong irritation or a flash of anger, or it may be a purely physical symptom. Whatever it is, catch it before it can take over your thinking or behavior. This simply means putting the spotlight of your attention on it. If it is an emotion, feel the strong energy charge behind it. Know that it is the pain body. At the same time, be the knowing. That is to say, be aware of your conscious presence and feel its power. Any emotion that you take your presence into will quickly subside and become transmuted. If it is a purely physical symptom, the attention that you give it will prevent it from turning into an emotion or a thought. Then continue to be alert and wait for the next sign of the pain body. When it appears, catch it again in the same way as before. Later, when the pain body has fully awakened from its dormant state, you may experience considerable turbulence in your inner space for a while, perhaps for several days. Whatever form this takes, stay present. Give it your complete attention. Watch the turbulence inside you. Know it is there. Hold the knowing and be the knowing. Remember, do not let the pain body use your mind and take over your thinking. Watch it. Feel its energy directly inside your body. As you know, full attention means full acceptance. Through sustained attention and thus acceptance, there comes transmutation. The pain body becomes transformed into radiant consciousness, just as a piece of wood, when placed in or near a fire, itself is transformed into fire. Menstruation will then become not only a joyful and fulfilling expression of your womanhood, but also a sacred time of transmutation. When you give birth to a new consciousness, your true nature then shines forth both in its female aspect as the goddess, and in its transcendental aspect, as the divine being, that you are beyond male and female duality. If your male partner is conscious enough, he can help you with the practice I have just described by holding the frequency of intense presence, particularly at this time. If he stays present whenever you fall back into unconscious identification with the pain body, which can and will happen at first, you will be able to quickly rejoin him in that state. This means that whenever the pain body temporarily takes over, whether during menses or at other times, your partner will not mistake it for who you are. Even if the pain body attacks him, as it probably will, he will not react to it as if it were you. Withdraw, or put up some kind of defense. He will hold the space of intense presence. Nothing else is needed for transformation. At other times, you will be able to do the same for him or help him reclaim consciousness from the mind, by drawing his attention into the here and now, whenever he becomes identified with his thinking. In this way, a permanent energy field of a pure and high frequency will arise between you. No illusion, no pain, no conflict, nothing that is not you, and nothing that is not love can survive in it. This represents the fulfillment of the divine transpersonal purpose of your relationship. It becomes a vortex of consciousness that will draw in many others. Give up the relationship with yourself. When one is fully conscious, would one still have a need for a relationship? Would a man still feel drawn to a woman? Would a woman still feel incomplete without a man? Enlightened or not, you are either a man or a woman. So on the level of your form identity you are not complete. You are one half of the whole. This incompleteness is felt as male-female attraction, the pull toward the opposite energy polarity, no matter how conscious you are. But in that state of interconnectedness, you feel this pull somewhere on the surface or periphery of your life. Anything that happens to you in that state feels somewhat like that. The whole world seems like waves or ripples on the surface of a vast and deep ocean. You are that ocean and, of course, you are also a ripple, but a ripple that has realized its true identity as the ocean, and compared to that vastness and depth, the world of waves and ripples is not all that important. This does not mean that you don't relate deeply to other people or to your partner. In fact, 
You can relate deeply only if you are conscious of being. Coming from being, you are able to focus beyond the veil of form. In being, male and female are one. Your form may continue to have certain needs, but being has none. It is already complete and whole. If those needs are met, that is beautiful. But whether or not they are met makes no difference to your deep inner state. So it is perfectly possible for an enlightened person, if the need for the male or female polarity is not met, to feel a sense of lack or incompleteness on the outer level of his or her being, yet at the same time be totally complete, fulfilled, and at peace within. In the quest for enlightenment, is being gay a help or a hindrance, or does it not mail any difference? As you approach adulthood, uncertainty about your sexuality followed by the realization that you are different from others may force you to disidentify from socially conditioned patterns of thought and behavior. This will automatically raise your level of consciousness above that of the unconscious majority, whose members unquestioningly take on board all inherited patterns. In that respect, being gay can be a help. Being an outsider to some extent, someone who does not fit in with others or is rejected by them for whatever reason, makes life difficult but it also places you at an advantage as far as enlightenment is concerned. It takes you out of unconsciousness almost by force. On the other hand, if you then develop a sense of identity based on your gayness, you have escaped one trap only to fall into another. You will play roles and games dictated by a mental image you have of yourself as gay. You will become unconscious. You will become unreal. Underneath your ego mask, you will become very unhappy. If this happens to you, being gay will have become a hindrance, but you always get another chance, of course. Acute unhappiness can be a great awakener. Is it not true that you need to have a good relationship with yourself and love yourself before you can have a fulfilling relationship with another person? All you really need to do is accept this moment fully. You are then at ease in the here and now and at ease with yourself. But do you need to have a relationship with yourself at all? Why can't you just be yourself? When you have a relationship with yourself, you have split yourself into two. T and myself, subject and object. That mind-created duality is the root cause of all unnecessary complexity, of all problems and conflict in your life. In the state of enlightenment, you are yourself you, and yourself merge into one. You do not judge yourself. You do not feel sorry for yourself. You are not proud of yourself, you do not love yourself, you do not hate yourself, and so on. The split caused by self-reflective consciousness is healed, its curse removed. There is no self that you need to protect, defend, or feed anymore. When you are enlightened, there is one relationship that you no longer have. The relationship with your C pounds once you have given that up. All your other relationships will be love relationships. Chapter 9 Beyond happiness and unhappiness there is peace. The higher good beyond good and bad. Is there a difference between happiness and inner peace? Yes. Happiness depends on conditions being perceived as positive. Inner peace does not. Is it not possible to attract only positive conditions into our life? If our attitude and our thinking are always positive, we would manifest only positive events and situations, wouldn't we? Do you truly know what is positive and what is negative? Do you have the total picture? There have been many people for whom limitation, failure, loss, illness, or pain in whatever form turned out to be their greatest teacher. It taught them to let go of false self-images and superficial ego-dictated goals and desires. It gave them depth, humility, and compassion. It made them more real. Whenever anything negative happens to you, there is a deep lesson concealed within it, although you may not see it at the time. Even a brief illness or an accident can show you what is real and unreal in your life, what ultimately matters and what doesn't. Seen from a higher perspective, conditions are always positive. To be more precise, they are neither positive nor negative. They are as they are. And when you live in complete acceptance of what is which is the only sane way to live there is no good or bad in your life anymore. There is only a higher good which includes the bad. Seen from the perspective of the mind. However, there is good bad, like dislike, love hate. Hence, in the book of Genesis, it is said that Adam and Eve were no longer allowed to dwell in paradise. When they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
This sounds to me like denial and self-deception. When something dreadful happens to me or someone close to me accident, illness, pain of some kind or death, I can pretend that it isn't bad. But the fact remains that it is bad. So why deny it? You are not pretending anything. You are allowing it to be as it is. That's all. This allowing to be takes you beyond the mind with its resistance patterns that create the positive-negative polarities. It is an essential aspect of forgiveness. Forgiveness of the present is even more important than forgiveness of the past. If you forgive every moment allow it to be as it is then there will be no accumulation of resentment that needs to be forgiven at some later time. Remember that we are not talking about happiness here. For example, when a loved one has just died, or you feel your own death approaching, you cannot be happy. It is impossible, but you can be at peace. There may be sadness and tears, but provided that you have relinquished resistance. Underneath the sadness you will feel a deep serenity, a stillness, a sacred presence. This is the emanation of being. This is inner peace, the good that has no opposite. What if it is a situation that I can do something about? How can I allow it to be and change it at the same time? Do what you have to do. In the meantime, accept what is. Since mind and resistance are synonymous, acceptance immediately frees you from mind dominance and thus reconnects you with being. As a result, the usual ego motivations for doing fear, greed, control, defending or feeding the false sense of self will cease to operate. An intelligence much greater than the mind is now in charge, and so a different quality of consciousness will flow into your doing. It seems that most people need to experience a great deal of suffering before they will relinquish resistance, and accept before they will forgive. As soon as they do, one of the greatest miracles happens. The awakening of being consciousness through what appears as evil, the transmutation of suffering into inner peace. The ultimate effect of all the evil and suffering in the world is that it will force humans into realizing who they are beyond name and form. Thus, what we perceive as evil from our limited perspective is actually part of the higher good that has no opposite. This, however, does not become true for you except through forgiveness. Until that happens, evil has not been redeemed and therefore remains evil. Through forgiveness, which essentially means recognizing the insubstantiality of the past and allowing the present moment to be as it is. The miracle of transformation happens not only within but also without. A silent space of intense presence arises both in you and around you. Whoever or whatever enters that field of consciousness will be affected by it, sometimes visibly and immediately, sometimes at deeper levels, with visible changes appearing at a later time. You dissolve discord heal pain, dispel unconsciousness without doing anything simply by being, and holding that frequency of intense presence. In that state of acceptance and inner peace, even though you may not call it bad, can anything still come into your life that would be called bad from a perspective of ordinary consciousness? Most of the so-called bad things that happen in people's lives are due to unconsciousness. They are self-created, or rather ego created. I sometimes refer to those things as drama. When you are fully conscious, drama does not come into your life anymore. Let me remind you briefly how the ego operates and how it creates drama. Ego is the unobserved mind that runs your life when you are not present as the witnessing consciousness, the watcher. The ego perceives itself as a separate fragment in a hostile universe, with no real inner connection to any other being surrounded by other egos which it either sees as a potential threat or which it will attempt to use for its own ends. The basic ego patterns are designed to combat its own deep-seated fear and sense of lack. They are resistance, control, power, greed, defense, attack. Some of the ego strategies are extremely clever, yet they never truly solve any of its problems, simply because the ego itself is the problem. When egos come together, whether in personal relationships or in organizations or institutions. Bad things happen sooner or later. Drama of one kind or another, in the form of conflict, problems, power struggles, emotional or physical violence, and so on. This includes collective evils such as war, genocide, and exploitation all, due to massed unconsciousness. Furthermore, many types of illness are caused by the ego's continuous resistance 
which creates restrictions and blockages in the flow of energy through the body. When you reconnect with being and are no longer run by your mind, you cease to create those things. You do not create or participate in drama anymore. Whenever two or more egos come together, drama of one kind or another ensues. But even if you live totally alone, you still create your own drama. When you feel sorry for yourself, that's drama. When you feel guilty or anxious, that's drama. When you let the past or future obscure the present, you are creating time psychological time the stuff out of which drama is made. Whenever you are not honoring the present moment by allowing it to be, you are creating drama. As long as they are their mind, what they fear and resist most is their own awakening. When you live in complete acceptance of what is, that is the end of all drama in your life. Nobody can even have an argument with you. No matter how hard he or she tries, you cannot have an argument with a fully conscious person. An argument implies identification with your mind and a mental position, as well as resistance and reaction to the other person's position. The result is that the polar opposites become mutually energized. These are the mechanics of unconsciousness. You can still make your point clearly and firmly, but there will be no reactive force behind it, no defense or attack, so it won't turn into drama. When you are fully conscious, you cease to be in conflict. No one who is at one with himself can even conceive of conflict, states A Course in Miracles. This refers not only to conflict with other people, but more fundamentally to conflict within you which ceases when there is no longer any clash between the demands and expectations of your mind and what is impermanence and the cycles of life. However, as long as you are in the physical dimension and linked to the collective human psyche, physical pain, although rare, is still possible. This is not to be confused with suffering, with mental emotional pain. All suffering is ego-created and is due to resistance. Also, as long as you are in this dimension, you are still subject to its cyclical nature and to the law of impermanence of all things. But you no longer perceive this as bad it just is. Through allowing the isness of all things, a deeper dimension underneath the play of opposites reveals itself to you as an abiding presence, an unchanging deep stillness, an uncaused joy beyond good and bad. This is the joy of being, the peace of God. On the level of form, there is birth and death, creation and destruction growth and dissolution of seemingly separate forms. This is reflected everywhere. In the life cycle of a star or a planet, a physical body, a tree, a flower, in the rise and fall of nations, political systems, civilizations, and in the inevitable cycles of gain and loss in the life of an individual. There are cycles of success, when things come to you and thrive, and cycles of failure, when they wither or disintegrate and you have to let them go in order to make room for new things to arise, or for transformation to happen. If you cling and resist at that point, it means you are refusing to go with the flow of life, and you will suffer. The down cycle is absolutely essential for spiritual realization. You must have failed deeply on some level or experienced some deep loss or pain to be drawn to the spiritual dimension. Or perhaps your very success became empty and meaningless, and so turned out to be failure. Failure lies concealed in every success, and success in every failure. In this world, which is to say on the level of form, everybody fails sooner or later, of course, and every achievement eventually comes to naught. All forms are impermanent. You can still be active and enjoy manifesting and creating new forms and circumstances, but you won't be identified with them. You do not need them to give you a sense of self. They are not your life only your life situation. Your physical energy is also subject to cycles. It cannot always be at a peak. There will be times of low as well as high energy. There will be periods when you are highly active and creative, but there may also be times when everything seems stagnant. When it seems that you are not getting anywhere, not achieving anything. A cycle can last for anything from a few hours to a few years. There are large cycles and small cycles within these large ones. Many illnesses are created through fighting against the cycles of low energy, which are vital for regeneration. The compulsion to do, and the tendency to derive your sense of self-worth and identity from external factors such as achievement, 
is an inevitable illusion as long as you are identified with the mind. The cyclical nature of the universe is closely linked with the impermanence of all things and situations. The Buddha made this a central part of his teaching. All conditions are highly unstable and in constant flux, or, as he put it, impermanence is a characteristic of every condition, every situation you will ever encounter in your life. It will change, disappear, or no longer satisfy you. Impermanence is also central to Jesus' teaching. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. As long as a condition is judged as good by your mind, whether it be a relationship, a possession, a social role, a place, or your physical body, the mind attaches itself to it and identifies with it. It makes you happy, makes you feel good about yourself, and it may become part of who you are or think you are, but nothing lasts in this dimension where moth and rust consume. Either it ends or it changes, or it may undergo a polarity shift. The same condition that was good yesterday or last year has suddenly or gradually turned into bad. The same condition that made you happy, then makes you unhappy. The prosperity of today becomes the empty consumerism of tomorrow. The happy wedding and honeymoon become the unhappy divorce or the unhappy coexistence. Or a condition disappears, so its absence makes you unhappy. When a condition or situation that the mind has attached itself to and identified with changes or disappears, the mind cannot accept it. It will cling to the disappearing condition and resist the change. It is almost as if a limb were being torn off your body. We sometimes hear of people who have lost all their money, or whose reputation has been mind committing suicide. Those are the extreme cases. Others, whenever a major loss of one kind or another occurs, just become deeply unhappy or make themselves ill. They cannot distinguish between their life and their life situation. I recently read about a famous actress who died in her 80s. As her beauty started to fade and became ravaged by old age, she grew desperately unhappy and became a recluse. She too had identified with a condition, her external appearance. First, the condition gave her a happy sense of self, then an unhappy one. If she had been able to connect with the formless and timeless life within, she could have watched and allowed the fading of her external form, from a place of serenity and peace. Moreover, her external form would have become increasingly transparent to the light shining through from her ageless true nature, so her beauty would not really have faded, but simply become transformed into spiritual beauty. However, nobody told her that this is possible. The most essential kind of knowledge is not yet widely accessible. The Buddha taught that even your happiness is dukkha a Pali word meaning suffering or unsatisfactoriness. It is inseparable from its opposite. This means that your happiness and unhappiness are in fact one. Only the illusion of time separates them. This is not being negative. It is simply recognizing the nature of things so that you don't pursue an illusion for the rest of your life. Nor is it saying that you should no longer appreciate pleasant or beautiful things or conditions, but to seek something through them that they cannot give an identity, a sense of permanency and fulfillment, is a recipe for frustration and suffering. The whole advertising industry and consumer society would collapse if people became enlightened and no longer sought to find their identity through things. The more you seek happiness in this way, the more it will elude you. Nothing out there will ever satisfy you except temporarily and superficially, but you may need to experience many disillusionments before you realize that truth. Things and conditions can give you pleasure, but they will also give you pain. Things and conditions can give you pleasure, but they cannot give you joy. Nothing can give you joy. Joy is uncaused and arises from within as the joy of being. It is an essential part of the inner state of peace the state that has been called the peace of God. It is your natural state, not something that you need to work hard for or struggle to attain. Many people never realize that there can be no salvation in anything they do, possess or attain. Those who do realize it often become world-weary and depressed. If nothing can give you true fulfillment, what is there left to strive for? What is the point in anything? The Old Testament prophet must have arrived at such a realization when he wrote, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. When you reach this point, you are one step away from despair and one step away from enlightenment, 
A Buddhist monk once told me, all I have learned in the 20 years that I have been a monk I can sum up in one sentence, all that arises passes away, this I know. What he meant, of course, was this, I have learned to offer no resistance to what is, I have learned to allow the present moment to be, and to accept the impermanent nature of all things and conditions, thus have I found peace. To offer no resistance to life is to be in a state of grace, ease, and lightness. This state is then no longer dependent upon things being in a certain way, good or bad. It seems almost paradoxical. Yet when your inner dependency on form is gone, the general conditions of your life, the outer forms, tend to improve greatly. Things, people, or conditions that you thought you needed for your happiness, now come to you with no struggle or effort on your part and you are free to enjoy and appreciate them while they last. All those things, of course, will still pass away. Cycles will come and go. But with dependency gone, there is no fear of loss anymore. Life flows with ease. The happiness that is derived from some secondary source is never very deep. It is only a pale reflection of the joy of being. The vibrant peace that you find within as you enter the state of non-resistance. Being takes you beyond the polar opposites of the mind and frees you from dependency on form. Even if everything were to collapse and crumble all around you, you would still feel a deep inner core of peace. You may not be happy, but you will be at peace, using and relinquishing negativity. All inner resistance is experienced as negativity in one form or another. All negativity is resistance. In this context, the two words are almost synonymous. Negativity ranges from irritation or impatience to fierce anger, from a depressed mood or sullen resentment to suicidal despair. Sometimes the resistance triggers the emotional pain body, in which case even a minor situation may produce intense negativity, such as anger, depression, or deep grief. The ego believes that through negativity, it can manipulate reality and get what it wants. It believes that through it, it can attract a desirable condition or dissolve an undesirable one. A Course in Miracles rightly points out that, whenever you are unhappy, there is the unconscious belief that the unhappiness buys you what you want. If you the mind did not believe that unhappiness works, why would you create it? The fact is, of course, that negativity does not work. Instead of attracting a desirable condition, it stops it from arising. Instead of dissolving an undesirable one, it keeps it in place. Its only useful function is that it strengthens the ego, and that is why the ego loves it. Once you have identified with some form of negativity, you do not want to let go, and on a deeply unconscious level, you do not want positive change. It would threaten your identity as a depressed, angry, or hard done by person. You will then ignore, deny or sabotage the positive in your life. This is a common phenomenon. It is also insane. Negativity is totally unnatural. It is a psychic pollutant, and there is a deep link between the poisoning and destruction of nature and the vast negativity that has accumulated in the collective human psyche. No other life form on the planet knows negativity, only humans, just as no other life form violates and poisons the earth that sustains it. Have you ever seen an unhappy flower or a stressed oak tree? Have you come across a depressed dolphin? A frog that has a problem with self-esteem? A cat that cannot relax? 